What's the thing that scares you the most? Confined spaces and uh, uh, blood particles in the air, the dark, that coral thing that's been staring at me since I came in here. Chris, I'm scared to death. Welcome to the Sum of All Fear podcast, the show that examines real life phobias and the horror movies that prey on them. So pour yourself something strong, Feardos, and let's find out what makes you afraid. Shiny new intro. We have a shiny new intro. I like it. You did a great job. You did a great job. I didn't do you, hardly anything. You did talking. For 10 seconds. Talking's important. Uh, well, welcome back, Feardos. Hey, Feardos. Uh, we are the sum of all fear podcast. Like you noticed. Um, we look at real life phobias from a mental health perspective and then pair those fears with horror movies that prey on them. We do our gosh darn bestest. Yeah. It. And I'm Drew. I'm uh, one of your hosts. I'm a writer and a horror nerd. And this is my sassy little book nerd of a wife, uh, Chris. Ooh, sassy little book nerd. I love that. Uh, and she's also a professional mental health therapist. I do. Things which gives sometimes. us some actual credibility on this show. Not That's much. Good. If you've ever met me, not much credibility. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, man, we have been like, it's, I feel like it's been so long since we recorded. It's only been like, this is only well, two weeks, two weeks right? you know, which isn't, I know occasionally we try, been trying to do the week, the every week thing, but man, but there are so many, there things are some have weeks, happened. there are some weeks it's just, it just can't happen. I know. You know, you, you gotta do, be realistic. You know, we're, we're, this is, this is real life. We know just like you guys, there are other things going on, uh, besides podcasting and podcasting yeah. is a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I find it quite fun, but I don't it is, do it's really everything. Fun. It's fun, but it's but it's a lot of. There's a lot that goes into it. You do um, everything. Well, just think this, the notes. Just just researching each topic. And you don't have to take seven pages of notes every time, though. Kinda. I mean, <laughs> you kind of do if you want to do it right, right? I mean, no, because if you listen to the first couple of episodes, I had seven pages of notes then, and I was like shuffling and like you ah, were just oh, trying blah, to blah, find blah, your blah, feet, blah. baby. It takes some time. I still don't have. You my can't feet. just. You can't just. You know. You can't grab the bull unless you got the balls. Oh. Isn't that a saying? No. That's like one of your sayings. I mean, it could be. I made it up just like you do with yours. You're not as good at I'm it not as, as good I at am, it. though. Like, I'm pretty <laughs> damn good at coming up with weird shit. You, uh, I do say so myself. I, I don't know. Grab the horns and the balls. I, there was something it in there. There was the something s- there. <laughs> You're going to have to develop that Steer a little bit Steer wrestling. More. There's, you got your, I don't know, arm. There's a, there's a thing. It's a thing. Um, well, yeah, it's been a busy couple weeks. Sorry for missing a week. Uh, I was working in Paradise, California. Ooh, lovely. Wait um, a minute. Yeah, which uh, burned down last year yeah, in the in campfire. Case some of you don't know, you know, that 3% in the UK and in Europe. Yeah, might have missed might have missed that one last year, but it was it's pretty wild. It's I mean it's it's starting to be rebuilt. So that you know if 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 you are not familiar, they had a wildfire last year uh, over in Paradise, California that just wiped out the entire town. Um, really sad, a beautiful little town too. It's it's up on a ridge, um, in an area that I have spent a lot of time because I, I do a lot of fishing over there, um, in that area. And it was it was pretty wild, man. It, it really did just wipe everything out. And they're they're starting. We're we're about a year, I think, about a year from then. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're just, they've, the grocery store is open. There's a couple of little businesses starting to to reopen. Um, you know, there's a few things popping back up. Um, there was some houses that were, you know, people are rebuilding. There's, uh, I think about 10,000 people back in town. It takes time. Um, but it's, it's going to be a time, a time consuming thing. And I was working on a medical equipment that was, uh, had been in the hospital and, uh, uh, the company that I'm working for uh, does a lot of uh, medical equipment restoration and biomedical uh, stuff. So we were doing that and it was kind of interesting work last weekend. I was in San Francisco for a couple of days uh, mm-hmm. shadowing, uh, shadowing my, my, my buddy Billy who I'm working with uh, right now, which is cool. Um, so I was in San Francisco for a couple of days and you know, San Francisco was just good old San Francisco. Oh, San Fran. <laughs> we, he has you stayed little, in the hate though too, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, we were right in the hate. Yeah, yeah right in the hate. Uh, and it was, it was, it was, it was fun. It's always a good time. Didn't you tell me that there's like a, a culture to, to the San Francisco Island specifically? Yeah. Well, it was funny because uh, uh, our friend 
Billy was was referencing island time all the time. So I guess in San Francisco, everybody just kind of has this like they live on island time, you know, which well, is heard that. which is laid back, very like whatever, you know, we'll get it done, we get it done, and people take off work at like two o'clock, and you know, I've heard that for like the Hawaiian Hawaiians, islands, yeah. you know, and other tropical islands. So it's interesting that it's in San Francisco. Yeah, and uh, you've been coaching and doing some roller derby. Oh yeah, the last yeah, couple of weeks. We're preparing Getting back in the in the swing of things. We're preparing Nevada Day uh, celebration, very big celebration around these parts our nevada day is the same as the same day as halloween yeah so the october 31st in, in nevada is also nevada day so they normally have a day i don't know why they don't just give the day after the day like the day of halloween and the day after off as like state holidays be so perfect i don't understand it either because mardi gras is a holiday in louisiana so couldn't sure. the state of nevada oh they could deem absolutely the 31st a holiday yeah, every single year but no instead yep. it's on the 26th slash 20 yeah they do it like the friday before which makes no sense do it on halloween like give the kids the day Saturday off before. and then give them an extra day off the next day to maybe and then you could do the parade on that day or something right. you know make it but in carson make city it cool. or do the parade halloween morning that'd be cool too the in carson city the capital city um they have this parade that's like 300 float entries long it's insane and it goes almost all day yeah. it's almost like mardi gras-esque Without the fun. Without. <laughs> Mardi Gras without the fun. No. Well, I mean, without the beats, There's a I lot guess, of people getting drunk. But there's so much drinking. Yeah, there's and a lot so of we're going to be playing sure. roller derby that weekend um, in a big tournament uh, The same Carson The same City. day as, as, as the aforementioned Billy's uh, 40th birthday. Oh, and he's having a big old bash, it's big old Halloween really party. Tough weekend. Crazy Halloween decorations. The guy does. The guy does. Uh, he does a good job with the Halloween parties. Parties are always. Epic. And then we're. He's and then like, we're. And then we're also hosting. Uh, this is the first time we've announced this. I think we're also hosting a horror movie marathon at Jub Jub's Thirst Parlor on Wells Avenue uh, on Sunday the twenty seventh, starting at one o'clock, going till midnight. I forgot to put that in my notes, but one o'clock to midnight, we're going to be doing horror movies straight through, and we're going to be hosting it. Well, I'm going to be hosting half of it and you're going to be coming back from roller derby. And then well, let's hope because that means if, if we do, if I am late, that means we are champions, Woo-hoo. which is great. Yay. Um, um, and then we're going to put, we're going to push some couches up by the stage. We're going to have a big projector. We're going to have, like, can I have some deal. bags so of ice ready? It should be really fun. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll douse you in ice. So <laughs> you're, we'll put you in a bucket. Can I get, yeah. Can I get a cold ice tub? And then we're heading to LA. 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 On Wednesday. I heard the tacos are great in LA. They're so good in LA. Oh, we got to get the tacos in LA. So we're going for our horror vacation, um, which I'm super excited about. Horrorcation? Our horrorcation? That's a whole different vacation. Horrorcation? I heard that's in Jamaica. (laughs) Hedonism? Hedonism. Uh, I'm super excited because uh, we're going to be doing Universal Horror Nights, uh, Halloween Horror Nights for the first time. I'm so scared. Uh, that's going to be a blast, man. We're also going to be going to Scream Fest, which is uh, a horror movie you know, festival um, You know where they're premiering a bunch of movies. We're going to be seeing a movie called The Wretched, which looks really badass. Ugh, yeah. Um, and then the premiere of uh, Omar Epps uh, from uh, House. House. Uh, the guy from House, uh, his new movie, Trick, um, which takes place on Halloween as well. Um, has this whole Halloween backstory. So I think that's going to be super fun. Are we going to get like a red, red carpet? carpet I think so. Up. I think it's going to be like red carpety dolled up. Okay. Uh, I need to bring some red carpet. Shit, I think. I don't know. I've never been to Scream Fest. It might just be, it might be like the poor man's Beyond Fest, which was going on this last week. You so should Google that fucker and see. I have Googled that fucker already. Okay. Thank you. Um, and it looks like a good time. Um, and then I think uh, we're going to hit the Evil Dead Museum. Yeah. At the Mystic Museum. Uh, Evil Dead exhibit at the Mystic Museum. I, I don't think say. we're going to go through the Museum of Death, but I do need a new mug. Well, we could always stop in for sure. Um, and if we're there, we may as well go for a walk mm. through the hallowed halls of the Museum of Death. Um, and we're going to see a matinee of Prom Night 2. Hello, Mary Lou. Hello, Mary Lou. Which is going to be super cool. At the New Bev Theater, which I just, I love that place. I went last year at Christmas time for the Christmas horror stuff. It's it going to be my first time. It was so much fun. I love it. It's Tarantino's theater. He bought it and uh, restored it, you know, helped restore it. And um, it's just one screen theater. That's just badass in LA. So we got all kinds of fun stuff coming up. Finally getting a chance to like breathe and who like go and relax for a few days. So that is a very good thing. I'm going to, I'm going to dub this season. Thank fall. Say, Oh, that's nice. Because I'm very I like thankful that. That's, that the summer that wasn't is over. That is wonderful. That's a great idea. Thank I like you. that a lot. Good, good idea. Good idea. Um, I am thankful. Thankful. 
And I'm also thankful for our new Feardo friend, Cody, that we talked about on the last episode because hey, he hey. signed up to be our uh, newest Patreon. Hey, thanks, Cody. So, thanks, Cody. And if you like the show, um, we'd love to get to know you on social media. So come join the conversation at Some of All Fear Podcast on Facebook and at Some of All Fear Pod on Twitter and Instagram. And if the uh, the spirit moves you, you can support us on Patreon like our like our buddy Cody. Thank you, Cody, from Iowa. We appreciate it. Thanks, Cody. Um, and of course, please go to your podcast apps and give us a rating and review, and we will give you a shout out on the podcast as well. And if anyone wants uh, some stickers, we got some cool stickers. Just shoot us a message with your address, and we will send you some. And you can put them all over your dive bar, bathroom walls, and gas stations, and vandalize your local telephone poles. <laughs> um. And, and we would we would really appreciate that. Appreciate your vandalism. It'd be great if you just put them on your water bottles too. Or you could put them like on your laptop cool. or your water bottle, whatever. You know, yeah. If you want to be boring, boring, put them on your car. That'd be cool. <laughs> boring is sexy. <laughs> uh, so we are doing, we're going to do uh, What the Fear a little different today. Oh, yeah. We're mixing it up because I found a fun game. Yeah. Chris Chris found a, a, a horror, a horror uh, movie trivial pursuit. Woo. Hundred years of horror edition. Yeah, and it's so it's just a big old stack of Trivial Pursuit cards, but it's horror based. And every uh, color, you know, like Trivial Pursuit does with the colors, um, every color roll is a different like category. One's slashers, one's uh, I think one's gore, one's uh, international. It's it's all it's all mixed up. So we're gonna play that uh, for we're gonna play it for a few weeks and, and mix it up a little bit. I was getting a little bored with the with the uh, with the other games. So we're gonna do three rolls. Three rolls. And they I will can't determine make a pie. Your... I can't make a Trivial Pursuit pie with three rolls. You can't, but you... How am I going to win the game? But pie does start with 3.16, right? It does. So wow. there you go. That was really nerdy. Hey, I am a gigantic nerd. Haven't we established <laughs> that on this podcast already that I'm the nerd? All right. So are you ready? Yes. Go ahead and roll. Um, we're oh, going. Wait, no, 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 we haven't started yet. We haven't even, we haven't even done our intro yet. We got to do, we got to do the scat <laughs> We intro. haven't done the jingle. We can't get into the jingle scat. Huh? The jingle scat. Oh, you're, you're gonna do the jingle scat? You're that gonna just do the jingle so scat. Gross. The word scat is just. Wrong. I know. I know. It's terrible. That's why I like. I'm not doing it. the jingle scat. I'm doing the intro. I know. <laughs> it's time da, da, for da, the da, world's da, greatest da, da, horror-based da, da, da. trivia game. What the fear? You say it now. What the fear? There you go. Okay, you have to say it like that. All right, we're going to do some What the Fear Horror Movie Trivial Pursuit Edition. Yeah, are you ready to roll? <laughs> I don't know. I had to, I had Hudson read me some of these questions uh and I I was like I was like maybe 50%. So So that means it's good. I it's, don't know. There's some hard questions in there. And there's there is. And, and, and you know just like with like regular Trivial Pursuit, there's just some things that pop up that you're like I don't I haven't seen that. Know. I haven't heard that. Do I get a pass? Can I get like one pass per round? And, no. I, and I can use it on the first one. If I use it on the first one, then I can't use it on the other ones. I think I should get one pass per round. One pass per Weatherveer. A re-roll. A re-roll, if you will. Uh, a re-roll. What do you think? All right. A Rick roll. Not a Rick roll. A Rick re-roll. Never gonna give you a... You have to, you have to sing that when I you want I have to sing it, that though. when I... When, I, when, when you want <laughs> it? Are you making up new rules? Yes. You know? <laughs> This is we're just like gonna fucking, gonna fucking games. just whatever as we do go you, along. Do you remember the drunk game where like um you would have to do things based on like someone's choice? So like someone's Truth choice. Truth dare double there? No, someone's <laughs> someone's choice could be like, okay, every time I put a Viking on my and you put like a little like a little figure up on your beer, then everybody else has to put a Viking too up on their I have beer. heard of this game, but I do not understand it at all. And I never played it. So. I don't understand it i'm very confused i played it many times but i could not tell you the rules or who won yeah i don't understand so i think the the goal is to get drunk well the goal that is always the goal of a good drinking game um the goal of this one however is to answer the questions correctly yes <laughs> very simple true um so should i roll the die i think you should all right roll <laughs> to die all right orange what is the orange category let's look at the look at the uh looks like the occult Ooh, the occult in Carrie, 1976, the blood of what animal is poured on the titular character on prom night? Oh, pig's blood. 
Pig's blood is correct. Yeah, talk about a softball to start out with. Right? That was an easy one. Well, give Do you not have the categories handy? Did they, were on the, they were on the back of the box that I just threw away, I think. Yeah. Are I they on the so. back of that? Oh. No. They're not. That's Bummer. okay. Let me see. Let me see the card real quick. No. Or a card. Not not the card. A card. So I think it's uh Oh, I don't know now. Shoot. We should grab the box out of the out of the oh, trash can. I... <laughs> cut and cut the back part out because it gives all the categories. And that, those are just like the symbols, so it's hard to tell. Eh, whatever. Okay. All right, I'm rolling again. I'm one for one. And blue. All blue. right. This is an eyeball. Let's see if you can also guess the category. Um, what is the name of the band Mari Collingwood and Phyllis Stone are going to see at the start of The Last House on the Left, 1972? Oh, man. That's brutal. Um, some hippie band. Some hippie, hippie some band. Some hippie band. I don't is? think they're going to see uh, like, is it? It's, it's not like an actual real band that I would know, is it? I don't, I don't know it. Okay. But. It may that doesn't mean anything. Ah, dude, I don't know. They were going to see some hippie band. Give it um, like a. I I I I'm, I don't know. I'm gonna have to give up on that one. Oh, let's do a pass. Reroll. Oh, reroll. Rick Rick reroll. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna let you. Okay, down. you can Rick reroll Never that one. Never gonna run around. I'm gonna Rick reroll. Rick reroll. Rick reroll. Rick reroll. Do it. I like it. I like this. This is good rules. We're making this up <laughs> as we go along. This is good. This is fun. This is fun shit right here. I'm going to make you keep going over like for like hours with this too. Cause this is just my, this is my wheelhouse. I love fun. trivia. I just I know. love trivia so much. That's why when I saw this at hot topic, I had to buy it for you. Oh, uh, we got a purple, a uh, purple. We got uh bats behind the moon. So bats behind the moon. So yes, that category cr- reachers or? what German electronic band composed no. the music for near dark in 1987. German electronic band near dark. Was it, I'm not great at my, at my horror movie music, but was it uh gremlin? No, no Go- goblin. No goblin. No, sorry. Bauhaus. No, uh, uh, German. I don't know. Tangerine dream. Oh man. I actually, <laughs> they, they did a bunch of horror movies. They actually did a whole shitload of stuff. Well, I don't know if I'd call goblin then. I guess they're not. In the You're zero for band. two on Trivial Pursuit. Yeah. So far, let's give it a third roll. And Chris and Satuta, Chris Satuta just threw something. Oh no, he threw something through a wall. Yeah, Metal Chris just threw something through a wall right now. Or someone because like, he knew the answer. Not only did he know the answer, but he, my answers, I guarantee, were just fucking terrible. <laughs> He's like, "What the fuck, Drew?" Yeah, that's an area that I need to bone up on. Uh, in my well, in my, luckily my for you, and uh, we talked about Tangerine re- Dream. We actually talked about Tangerine Dream on this podcast before. Believe it or not, I believe it because they were they were the the soundtrack of one of the movies we we did. Metal Chris will actually be at our movie night, spinning the DJ he records. Will. That's right, Metal of Chris will be horror sp- movie spinning scores, scores, spinning horror movie scores in between movies. So, so he can edumacate all of us. <sighs> I need it. I need it. I feel I brought feel like I brought shame to the horror movie family. You have. Yeah. He's angry at you right now. We're oh, all well. angry at you. Talk what about this gonna, in therapy. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? All right. Are we ready? Yep. Okay. One more roll. Blue. 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 Is that, am I just on blue and purple back and forth? Yeah. Blue eyeball again. In it must be body parts or something. In teeth. Which character is not subject to the titular trait of Don O'Keefe? Ryan, Bill, Toby, or Brad? So this is multiple So choice. which guy didn't... Not subject. Didn't bang the chick with the teeth in her vagina? Yes. I'm guessing. I haven't seen that movie yet. Whoever so wrote it's going to be a wild Whoever wrote wild this guess. question was like, how do I <laughs> write this? The titular... The titular that's they the second... Term. They use that term multiple times on those cards, I noticed. What's, it just means slutty, What right? were the names of the of the, people, the guys again? Ryan, Bill, Toby, or Brad. Like every Ryan, freaking... Bill, Toby, or Brad. Backwards hat bro. Ever. Let's go with the least bro name is Bill. It is Bill, the least bro name. I agree. Uh, and it is Bill. Yes. Good job. Least bro name. Least bro name. <laughs> He's the one who least deserved to have his dick munched by... <laughs> Teeth vagina. Oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> I think that's what happened. I don't know. I haven't seen it. It's you, a movie that I need that it's on my list. 
Well, you did very good at the uh, what the fear trivial pursuit horror horror, horror movie trivial movie pursuit edition years edition. Yeah, and that goes pretty quick. I like Great that. job. That's fun. Good good times. Good times. Well, we are talking about books today. Books, uh, which, which is really, uh, you know, a phobia that people are like, "What the fuck is that?" Like, there was a lot of people that are like, "What is this phobia? Fear of books? Like, that doesn't make any sense." Um, but it goes in a lot of different directions. Um, and a really fun one for horror movies. It's like a choose your own adventure phobia. Ooh, which is also a book. Could there be like a, like a subcategory where that is also a fear, like a fear of choose your own adventure. Books? Oh, well, I, that would be me. I'd be like, I don't know. I just, I give up. I go to the, I go, I go peek to the, to the last page. I go every I, single I peek to the page. Like, Oh, no, nope, I don't want to do that one. No, nah, no, nah, there's good. only one page in that one. <laughs> that the means I'm end. dead. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this phobia is, uh, uh uh, there's, there's so many like kind of like a little, like, like kind of rabbit holes you can go down mm-hmm. with this phobia. Uh, bibliophobia is going to be our fear today. And that is the, uh, the fear of books. So let's, uh, let's not dive in because I promised I wouldn't say that anymore. No, let's roll that beautiful bean to, footage. We're not going to roll any beautiful bean footage. <laughs> no, either, we are. Cause you promised you wouldn't say that anymore. Bean footage. Uh, because it, it's, it, it's a terrible visual. It's been bubbling below. And a my terrible bit, commercial. My beanie surface for weeks. You are such a nerd. Um, we are gonna, we're going to talk. <laughs> let's just get into it. We're going to talk bibliophobia, the fear of books. Hey, Chris. Hey, Drew. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? Why, yes, I have. When we were trying to get this podcast off the ground, we had a lot of questions. Like, how do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps people like to listen to? Um, How do we make money podcasting? The answer to every one of these questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. And best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now... Anchor can match you with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. Uh, In fact, that's what I'm doing right now just by reading this ad. Right now? Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now? That means if you want to get a podcast going and make money doing it, go to anchor.fm slash start. Join me and Chris and the diverse community of podcasters already using Anchor. That's anchor.fm slash start. We can't wait to hear your podcast. Yeah, I can't believe I said gremlin. Like, <laughs> there, and not only that, but goblin is not even German. They're and they Ita- sat over here. They're an Italian band, and they're not. Uh, they were not the band. And when you said that, I was band. like, "Did he think that I was asking for like a movie? Why would yeah, he?" She say looked at me really funny when I said Gremlins. Um, bibliophobia, the fear of books. Such an B- bibliophobia. Bibliophobia. I always want to like. Bibliophobia. want to accentuate the bi- bibliophobia. Bibliophobia uh, comes from the Greek word biblion, uh, which means book. Um, the definition of this phobia is: it's a fear or hatred of books. Such fear often arises from the fear of the effect books can have on society or culture. Uh, it's a common cause of censorship and book burning. Book burning. Book burning. Book There's a lot of bees. There's going to be a lot of... <laughs> well, and for Going back a, to our fear of chickens episode. For a bibliophiliac like myself, you know, I just, I go out and buy books every week just to have yeah, books. We both are. We both I are haven't even read like... <sighs> very many of them and I love loaning them out and I love hearing what people get from them, even if I haven't read them myself. So I truly love books and getting lost in a book. And, you know, you have your favorite kinds of books, but mine are like psychology books or, um, criminal justice or true crime, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. And you, well, like, I have your I mean, horror I'm, books. Well, and l- lately, you've got it's been, lately it's been horror, but I have like, yeah, I mean, I have, you know, I like I loved buying sets of of like historical books and and We've philosophy some, books and theology books. We have a we have we have, would have a huge library if we had a bigger house because we, we have, have a lot of books in the garage. We have a huge library of banned books here. <laughs> yeah, you know we own a lot of banned books. Martin oh, yeah. Luther, um, you know, 
censorship. Oh, banned. I was like, banned books? I'm like, I have a couple but of books. Like, I got some stuff on Johnny Cash. Not like and drummers. The, like, like the Sun Records books and Rockabilly. <laughs> like, and, get the hell out of here. Not like a drummer. <laughs> I got a Waylon Jennings biography. <laughs> Shut up. Um, <laughs> no. Like, banned as in, as, in, banned. as in ones that were at one censored. point. Censored. Censored or, yes, absolutely. I mean, there's then there's been a... a a ton of them throughout history. And it's amazing which ones were banned that you look at and you go, how, you know, that's like a, cl-. and typically when it's something is banned, it has become a classic oh, yeah. of, of literature or of, of, of ideology or whatever it might be because not just because it was banned, but because most of the time it was banned because it was challenging people's way of thinking. And that was important. Right. right? And that's what drew people to that book. And at the same time, books leading to individual thought, like, Fahrenheit 451, you know, the government fears this because then if the people can overpower their government, that's, that's terrifying to them when they lose control of their people. Well, and that goes into some of the history of, of, of literacy, which I think is really an interesting one. So, you know, you have, we, we, we live in a really fantastic time in human history. And I think people forget that, that we, we really are like, blessed people, you know, to be in this you know, period, most of us, I mean, most of us anyway, I mean, I'm sure there's, there may be some of you out there that are not, that are in, you know, maybe war torn countries or countries that are have, that are impoverished. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of listeners from all over the place. So I can't assume that, you know, you live somewhere that's, that's, that's in the same kind of socio economic situation that we, we are, but I know for my experience, in my experience, we live in an amazing time. You know, we have, we have access to as much knowledge as we, we can get our hands on. We have very low literacy, you know, illiteracy rates. Um, but it wasn't always like that. And, and most of civilization and most of time, you know, people didn't read, they didn't know how to read and, and they weren't taught to read. And, you know, you look back at ancient civilizations and the literacy rates were, were very, very low. Um, you know, with, with a little bit of an exception of the, you know, the Greeks uh, and the Romans in those cultures, literacy was a little bit higher. Um, But we always think of those as being very literate cultures. And actually it was like a third Mm -hmm. of the people. And that was considered extremely high. Right. Right. Um, Still the, the common people for the most part did, did not read. Um, Cause it was tough to read because somebody had to handwrite everything. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and you could only have one copy of something most of the time. And so, you know, and pass it, yeah, you, got, pass you pass it along around. and that's, you hope there that wasn't a lot of copies of made. Of yeah. like that. Sure. And there was also the, the, the fact that, you know, a lot of those cultures were, were oral cultures. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 totally oral cultures. Uh, they were passing, you know, so they were passing down information from generation to generation. Right. And and that was just how like the Hebrew culture, for example, was very, storytelling. very much all about, you know, not even storytelling, sorry, memorization. Like it was very important for whoever was in charge of passing down the information that they got it. Absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. Well, they were time. like human books. Absolutely. Human versions. Um, absolutely. And it was passed down from generation to generation to generation. Um, you know, it, and then as we get into, and we start rolling along to like the middle ages, you know, we've, you've probably heard those referred to as the dark ages. And the reason why it got that moniker rightly or wrongly. And I would argue, you know, what get kind of nerdy about it and say that maybe it wasn't quite as dark as people think it was. Um, there was a, still a lot going on during that time and learning and science and things that, you know, people kind of forget about, but that was a period of time when literally almost nobody could read the only people that had the power, um, of, of being able to, of the knowledge, you know, in their cultures were, were the priests, were the religious leaders, were the, you know, the scribes, like, you know, the people that were, there was a very, very small percentage. Um, and most of it in the middle ages, especially in the European, you know, European society, it was the church, right? Mm -hmm. The church had all of the people who could read were, were, were within that that priesthood. Well, and when you know, you we're the leadership in the church. When you have such a limited number of people that can translate information, you're bound to have people that translate things a little bit more loosely or interpret them a little bit. I don't even know if it's that, that the interpret part is the biggest thing. It's they you they that at that point they can use it to take advantage exactly. of the people, right? So if if the whole culture is based on on uh, religion, right? And at that point your religion and your politics were were one and the same. So your political leaders and your religious leaders were the same people. And they used that 
to control the masses. They used it to, you know, well, this is, we're the ones who can interpret the Bible for you, or we're the ones who can interpret this text for you. You can't do it on your own. So you have to listen to us. And by the time like the 15th, 16th century rolled around, it was super corrupt. You know, they were like making people do, you know, whatever they wanted them to do. Um, and that's when we had the printing press pop up and the printing press, the Gutenberg press in the 1400s made it possible now to distribute, you know, to disseminate information on a wider spectrum, making it more difficult for people to spread misinformation, more accessible, you know, so more people accessible. became more informed because and then you had people learning how to read because right. they had the ability to have a text in their hands. And, and that was when we had Martin Luther, like you were saying, come along and Martin Luther then kind of sparked this reformation, which was basically saying, Hey, the church, the Catholic church, you've, you've been manipulating us by saying you're the only ones who can interpret this text. Well, I'm reading it right now. And, half and the here shit, is what it's half says. the shit you're telling us is, is not in here. And then so, they came back and banned his stuff. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because they, they were like, ah, there was no so one. much banning fake news, all that stuff, <laughs> you know, it depended. And it was so funny because if, if you go through like history in Europe at that time, after the, like after, after the reformation started, you would go like to one country and it would be like, it'd be Catholic. And then a Protestant would come and, and, and conquer that area and it would switch it over and all the Catholic books were burned and all the Protestant books were burned in the other countries. That and seems like a waste of books. Like, my goodness. <laughs> it was crazy. But so that was a major shift in, in society it was we went from this, this, you know, where the whole world at that time, basically the most, the biggest parts of the world were illiterate. And all of a sudden now, they had the access to books. It was it's almost amazing. like, it's almost like we all had the realization of the value of literacy when we found out that, you know, the curtain had been pulled in front of our eyes, you know, by the people that we trusted to interpret these things. And so now there's a power in knowing what I'm reading. Oh, it was huge. And it was so big because it's, and, and that's when that sparked the, the Renaissance, right? So now we have a Renaissance in thought, a Renaissance in philosophy, a Renaissance in science, Renaissance in art, all of these things now opened up for us because people were able to learn. They were mm -hmm. able to really learn uh, those those deeper things that they weren't able to process, you know, before or put down in writing or whatever. Well, and something that has I I think been lost on us nowadays with you know advances in uh, the educational sciences and you know this is reading level four point six and you know six point eight and blah blah blah. But it, it, studies have shown that reading is learning, even if you don't understand all of the material. Absolutely. Just reading the words themselves in the sentence structures, seeing the patterns, your, your brain still learns from that. And so back then they didn't accommodate for various reader levels. It was, here's the Bible translated in, you know, English. Here you go. Yeah. You know, like figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah. You and, know, and, and honestly, it, and, and people out. read up to it and they started and then reading they, up to it. I love that. They didn't, they didn't, you know, and I, I remember that even as a, a, a kid, like my parents were always like, if you don't understand it, then read it again. You know, you need to, you'll, you'll understand it eventually. You may not understand it right now, but you're going to get it at some point. And I think there's something that's been lost there with people like reading. And, and actually it's funny that there's a debate going on within the school district here about a program that is making kids read up at a higher level um, who are struggling. Mm -hmm. They're actually making them move up to a higher level. Instead of bringing them back down to that level. Instead of bringing them level. down or lower, um, which, you know, very, very interesting. Um, so tell us a little bit about like, what does the fear, what is this, what's this phobia kind of entail? Where, where do we get the, cause we know that the Catholic church was afraid of losing their control, right? So there's some political leaders that say, well, if we let people read this, they might, they might rebel. Right. They, they might, might learn something that they don't like about what we're doing and then, you know, get all together and overtake us or overthrow our decisions. So we'll, we'll lose power if they somehow can understand this. Um, this fear though, in particular, what I kind of studied up on was the fear of, of reading material or of reading out loud in public. 
Well, that makes sense. You know, um, and that's part of bibliophobia. The shame, yeah. Reading out loud would reading would, would out loud. That. Like that would almost be a different phobia. So there's a ton of subsets. Um, this one's kind of lumped in because it is actually the fear of reading the words from a book out loud. So translating something visually to something verbal instead of just reading it with your eyes. Um, so it, there's an anxiety there, often sure. associated with social anxiety. Obviously, probably from being a kid when you were when you were told as a teacher right. when a teacher you told know? you you had to read out loud and you didn't know how to read I was very one, well, so you were like fast. I I was a good reader and I I still was like okay Mary oh, Joe's gonna like this paragraph and then that paragraph. this is mine. So this is mine. Yeah, this okay, is mine. okay. okay. practice I, in I my got like head. Two minutes. Yeah. I still to this very day have to repractice and or sometimes write down my orders for the drive through. Because I just get get anxiety caught up, like when I have to translate visual to verbal, you know, especially at a drive through. I'm like looking at a drive through menu. I'm like, fuck, I can't take in all this information. So that's a little bit um, of kind of where this comes from. There's an anxiety. Um, many folks we see with bibliophobia, bibliophobia have a subset. So that subset leads them to fearing or avoiding. Um, things that are associated with maybe specific types of books. So poetry, like metrophobia is the fear of poetry. Mythophobia is the fear of legends. Um, so picking a type, a subset, a genre of book and fearing that specific genre, that's also a subset of bibliophobia. Interesting. Um, but when it comes to that fear of reading out loud, uh, folks fear a lack of control over the reading material and that kind of makes it aversive. Um, so sometimes people with bibliophobia might even ask other people to read difficult things for them so that they can kind of interpret it easier because uh, it's easier said than read for them for some reason. Um, you can see why having an aversion to reading or an anxiety surrounding reading or on the extreme and a phobia surrounding reading or reading materials could affect your everyday work, oh, of course. life, yeah. spiritual, you know, interpersonal, every single fa financial yeah, aspect every facet, of your life. Every facet of your life. Could be right? Well, now we have, now we have books on tape, so it doesn't matter. Right. So somebody else could read it to you. So we're talking folks, <laughs> folks that we see with this kind of aversion to reading our folks that maybe have learning disabilities, Absolutely. dyslexia, dyslexia yeah. you know, it's really uncomfortable to try and read when your brain scrambles up, you know, letters and numbers and you're trying your hardest, but you can't fix, you can't fix that, you know, and, and that can be very frustrating. It can be very um, shame filling to feel like somehow you're defective, but really you're not, your brain just interprets things differently. And that's, that's nobody's fault. Um, but that shame and, and ostracism uh, leads them to not reading more, which leads them to getting more anxiety when they do have to read, which leads them to being more averse to reading. And it, it's a snowball effect. Um, that makes and, so much sense. And it often so snowballs into a hatred of school and social learning in general. So oh, hatred yeah. of college hatred of, you know, any environment that involves social learning because it's that all might, it's so, so much of it is book based. Although, you know, culture's probably changed. It's actually probably gotten better for people who have that phobia to, to actually participate in learning, um, with all of the options that are out there now. I mean, there's so many, so much stuff is done. Uh, with with video, so much is right. done with with audio, so much is done with with image based stuff, which is an interesting discussion as well. You know, I actually one of the things I wrote down was you know we 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 were talking about this this kind of progression through time. Well, we've now hit a time where we have kind of the reverse thing going on. We've we've kind of moved to a a, a time where we used to be a word based culture, very very centered on the written word. Mm -hmm. And we've moved to an image-based culture, um, which is much more all this digital, everything's TV focused, everything's, um, and I, you, you know, my favorite book. Oh yeah. Amusing um, ourselves to death. Yeah. And I highly, highly recommend it. I mean, even if you disagree with this premise, premises, um, it, it's a really, really interesting read and it was written in the eighties. So it actually, and he, he passed away, I think in 2003. So he didn't even see where a lot of this was going to go. Although he did predict kind of, he was kind of spot bit. on. Um, but it's a book called amusing ourselves to death by Neil Postman. 
And it's one of my favorite books because it just, it's so interesting and it, it just nails so many things that we don't even think about nowadays. Now, especially now with our freaking phones and everything, right. we don't we don't even think about it. But you talk about how the shift from books to visual media affect all of culture and, and, you know, in our modern era, like for example, he, he, he brings up the example of, of, uh, is it Taft? Was it Taft? The, the super fat president? I think it was. I think so. Um, how he would never have got, he would never get elected today. Right. Very right. smart man, brilliant dude, whatever. And people elected him because of his, you know, his writings and they read it in the newspaper and they heard his, you know, they, people, uh, wrote down his speeches and because that's like that. what was available. There was no radio. There was no, you couldn't hear him. You couldn't see him. So you, you, you just judged him, you just by, judged his, him by his ideas. Yeah. Right. Um, but nowadays that's impossible, right? Yeah, absolutely. We, you could not, you could not, I mean, could somebody who's, who's got a deformity become president? Could somebody who's overweight become president? I would hope so. Could somebody you know? who's, who's just butt ugly become president. I mean, you know, like, have you seen our current president? Yes. But Hey, he's, a, he was a, it was a celebrity that people, you know, saw on TV all the time. Some people out there thought, you know, this guy is, is what it is. No, that's not saying you have to be like gorgeous, but, but there's, there is something to be said for if there was a 400 pound man standing up on stage, giving this speech, you'd be like, your there's, instant judgment would be the visual. That media, this might, you, know, you might not elect this, this person. The visual media has a very great impact um, over the written media currently. It's a trip. Yes. And, 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 and so you think about how that affects all of culture and just, just that transition from kind of the written word to, where we are now, but like the everything written- is very and sound bites, and also we've gone from like being able to read these long, kind of deep, in depth philosophical ideas and ideologies, to now we want everything in our we've got a we very want everything short in three attention yeah span. we want everything yeah. in two minute sound bites and two minutes is even too long. But what's unfortunate about that is that we don't actually learn anything with any depth. We just glean ideas and then um, you know kind of fit them into. Um, what we think is correct. And then we go onto the internet and we find other people who, who agree, with, agree us. with us. Yep. And then, and then we kind of stay in that comfort zone because that's easy and that's comfortable. But books, books challenge all of that. When you read a book, you're forced into uncomfortable situations and you're forced to undergo uncomfortable things and feelings, just like the character in that book. And that's, that's still so valuable, which is why, um, you know, our culture in America places such a heavy emphasis on, you know, reading literacy and being able to read. And, and I wish it was even more so, but. Well, in our know. attention spans, we can't process information the same way. Processing. Yes. You think so like the Lincoln Douglas, like Abraham Lincoln debated uh, uh, Douglas, right. And the Lincoln Douglas debates um, were this incredible. They're, they're written down. You can read them but they were these incredible debates and they would go to places where people would sit for eight, nine hours, eight, nine hours to hear them debate back and forth. Their attention spans. That That was, that was entertainment because they were, they were probably, it was ideas. Why would I do that when I can Netflix and chill, you know, I'll get my ideas from Netflix and Hulu and YouTube or it's just, yeah, it's a completely different imager or not imager. And it's not saying, and and there's, there's benefits I think to both. I mean, there's definitely benefits to where we are now with technology. We, we get information so quickly and so amazingly. And, and, and there's something that's incredible about that, but it, I think again, just kind of goes back to what we were talking about last time uh, about moderation. You right. Know, kind of, there's there's room for both, and we need to we need to not let our children kind of get away with you know not learning how to sit down with the book and process. You know. Well, there are still some saying. very pivotal and influential books coming out nowadays, which is nice and important. Sure. And there are some shows that are coming out about very important books that may encourage kids or adults to go back and read those books. So like Handmaid's Tale, for instance, I can remember reading that book in high school and hating it and just being bored to tears. Watch the show. Also watch the thug notes. And now I <laughs> want to go back notes. and read it because I'm like, Oh my gosh, this you know, book was awesome. they're yeah. not allowed to read anything. Like the handmaids are not allowed to read all of their grocery merchandise is just pictures. Like, is that what we're heading towards? Right. We're in an image based society. Right. Like yeah. it blows my mind. And so I think there is some value to a really well done crossover. Um, that can oh, bring people back into there are, the book do you know world. How many, there are so many movies like 
uh, in, in the horror genre, especially like that are like, oh man, this is well, based it, on a book. I mean, uh, Stephen King, everything of course, Stephen everything King. Stephen King. And I see Stephen King stuff all the time, and I'm like, shit, I haven't read that. that right. looks, I'm going to go back and read that. Uh, I'm listening to Doctor Sleep, and audiobooks are another thing. It's not reading it, but audiobooks are are really incredible as well. And that was another. And I think I love to think creatively as I'm listening to something. I think I I I almost picture it more vividly as it's being read to me than when I'm reading it myself, but I try to do both. Well, you but might I really be, do enjoy it. You might be, um, and I'm doing Dr. Sleep and, and the shining right now. At the same you time. might be more of an audible learner. You know, you learn by hearing instead of by doing or by seeing or by, you know, writing, um, there people learn differently. And I do think that, that this, um, period that we're at right now with technology is really valuable in that, books can be delivered in a variety of mediums so that people can actually take them in. Um, and I, I almost think that schools should incorporate audiobooks for folks, you know. Well, that, actually Hank's teacher told him that they, he could, he could listen to an audio book oh, as long really as great. he was, as long as he was following along in the, in the book, in the book. See, which I, I think love that's a great, that. that's a great I think concept. that's a great idea. Um, so getting back to our, to our, our fear of books. Now fear of books has, like you said, turned people to banning books. Oh yeah. Um, and book burnings and, you know, obviously Nazi Germany, there was a time when, you know, there were so many books banned and mm -hmm. they would just have these massive book burnings, um, in, in communist Russia and, um, you know, going back all the way, going all the way back to Caligula, you know, Caligula didn't like the Odyssey because the Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey, uh, incorporated ideas of Greek uh, Greek ideas of freedom. Dude, Caligula was um, so fucked. I just read about him the other day. Yeah, super. Uh, Caliph Omar in 640 in Egypt burned 200,000 books from the library in Alexandria. Can you imagine? Like They're what dangerous. Amazing historical things got burned up no, in, that, in that fire. No, that terrifies me. That kind of stuff's just, that, that's the stuff that makes me I so have, sad. I have a bibliophobia, which is the fear of running out of books. Oh, yeah. And I also have the fear of finishing books. I hate finishing books. I feel like that finality, like I don't want to let go of You're that You're like world. that in every area of your life. I know. That is so symptomatic of like everything. Mm -hmm, she doesn't much. like to say goodbye. Like when we're at parties, she's an Irish goodbyer. So you she'll know what slip I like? out. She'll slip out and, 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 uh, and just be gone. You know what I like even more? The Irish hello. What's that? Where you just sneak in? And no, don't you just say anything? don't show up. You just don't show up at all? Yeah. It's the Irish <laughs> hello. It's my favorite. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, there is that fear of, you know, finishing books, fear of, um, you know, uh, writers have a fear of reading novels in their own genre for fear of being influenced in their next writing by, by that book and not wanting to steal it, you know? So being afraid of books would be really, really taxing regardless of the subset fear that you experience. I, I couldn't. I don't know what that would be like because I love books so much. I love the smell of. Oh, like I do too. I'm the same way. Old we, we, books. we are we are so the same that way. I know you had you had a library stamp I did. for your book. I still do. That's so yeah, fucking from nerdy. The library of Andrew Shattuck. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I you look at like I mean, Origin of the Species. Yep. Les Mis, uh, Leaves of Grass, Huckleberry Finn, Alice in Wonderland. Um, we talked a few episodes ago about scary stories to tell in the dark. Mm -hmm. All those books at one point were banned. Harry or, Potter. Or Harry Potter, you know, I mean. Um, Which now they have a world. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but, you know, it's, it's it really is incredible. For 400 years, the Catholic Church had a list of books that if you were a Catholic, you could not read. Oh. It was the, the Index Laborum Prohib Prohibitorum. <laughs> laborum Prohibitorum. Um. And, and they just basically, the Pope created this list that was like, nope, can't read that, you know. So arbitrary and so, so limiting. Like you're limiting people's power by not giving them access to those different points of knowledge so that they can make their own assessments about what they believe. And they knew how powerful it was. Well, in horror, we have a lot of we have, there's a lot of material with, uh, with books. I mean, and from a lot of different kind of, you know, you got your spell books, you've got your, your, your evil, mm -hmm. your evil books that are trying to attack you. You've got, you know, 
horror by living inside of a book and books finding that, out that you're in a book and books that live uh or books that make uh dead things come alive dead things come alive and witches come alive yeah and you know all manner of it creatures. really is interesting how horror like and horror has kind of kept that 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 words have power thing oh yeah alive a little bit I by mean, making and, and it's the not just horror there's there's other books and other genres that that you know other movies and other genres that have done that too but um let's talk real quick We'll, we'll transition here. Um, do you have anything that you wanted to add? Nope, I'm good. Um, let's transition Theme. real quick to to talking about the the like top evil books in horror. In horror. In horror. Okay. All right. So let's 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 uh, let's go into that real quick. Wait a minute. Hold it. Nobody said anything about three books. Why? Like, what am I supposed to do? Take take one book or all books or or what? So let's talk real quick. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I, wanna, I want to talk about evil books and horror movies. And mostly because I wanted to plug this guy's YouTube video because it was really good. Um, there's So go to YouTube. Check out um, the guy's name. Uh, the channel name is Jedediah Bishop. And... Uh, This video is 70 evil books in 50 horror movies. And he just kind of goes through and it's just a really well-made video. Nice. Uh, But then I started playing it, like going through his like channel a little bit. And he has a shit ton of other super cool videos um, with, (laughs) check check out this title, Uh, 40 rare J&B Scotch whiskey bottles in Giallo movies. (laughs) Wow. That's Uh, surprising. Video games, video games featured in horror movies. Huh? Um, Lovecraft and film, which was a really great little video, um, and tons and like just tons of other cool shit, uh, with like lots of clips of horror scores that are super badass. Um, highly recommend this channel. I just got, I went down a rabbit hole with it today. It was so good. Uh, so Jedediah Bishop, I will have to find him somewhere and tag him. Um, lots to entertain yourself if you're into that kind of thing. Chris, Chris, uh, metal Chris, go check out his channel because I think you'd like it. There's tons of, uh, horror score stuff on there too. Um, but I got, so I got, I was like, man, I hope some, I wish somebody would make a list of like all the evil books in horror movies and Light Jedediah Bishop did. So, um, so I, so I have this, so it's, it's great. It goes through all of these, these, this whole list. It starts of course with the Necronomicon, which we're going to talk about um, the Necrom- Necro- Necronomicon Ex Mortis from the evil dead, the evil dead Two, army of darkness and Jason goes to hell. Uh, I'm not going to read through all 50 of them, um, but I am going to, let's see. Diary of Patience Buckner from Cabin in the Woods was mentioned um, in the Mouth of Madness, which we'll be talking about today. Feature presentation. Uh, the Book of Nostradamus from the movie Demons. Um, the Handbook for the Recently Deceased, which I didn't <laughs> even think of, which I thought was a great Absolutely. one. Absolutely. From Beetlejuice. Yeah. Yeah, like really good one. You know what one was not on here, though, which was so funny, um, which I was like, man, how could he not include this one in this list? Um, the... Uh, Winifred Sanderson spellbook. Oh, from yeah. From Hocus Pocus. Yep. Which we watched last night with the boys. Great evil My book. My favorite. Great evil book. Uh, which I was so surprised he didn't have. He had so many obscure stuff in this list, but he didn't have that one. Um, and of that, of course, is it's not a horror movie, I guess. Oh my gosh, Hocus Pocus is absolutely in the genre. Like, I for it's sure my favorite. It's absolutely for the genre. season. It's a witches in Halloween, man. Wouldn't it be amazing if Joe Bob did the reviews on Hocus, or Hocus Pocus? Pocus? That'd be badass. I mean, Mick Garris wrote it. It's a, it's that's awesome. true. That's true. Um, and that's and that book is 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 such a central part of it. So right. like, I, I almost considered almost considered doing that as our honorable mention um, because it's it's you know. It's, it's such a fun movie, and and it's it's the right time of year. Um, We're getting muck. into Halloween. A muck, a muck, a muck, a muck, a muck. Uh, and you know, we had we had a blast watching it last night with the boys. It was really fun. I was, I always feel like it's Halloween time when you know you get your Hocus Pocus in. You got to get your Garfield Halloween in. Got to get your Charlie Brown, uh, Great Pumpkin in. You know, those are those to me like more than like the the horror horror movies. Those, those are, are kids essential. That, absolutely, because those bring back you know all the childhood memories. All the memories. So anyways, I just wanted to plug that, the the to go check out uh, that channel and the 70 evil books in 50 horror movies is the title. 
Um, so go do that. It's got uh, Mr. Babadook from the Babadook. So like the so anything that's kind of like book related Ooh, that brings Babadook. up spirits or or cast you know calls up uh, demons or or you know allows them spells to and yeah sorcery spells and... sorcery you know satanic rites um, you know the fun stuff any of that that stuff. Um, you know, there's a, there's, there's tons of movies out there, man. So let's go into the, the one that I think, uh, as far as evil books go, like books that are just bad books that you don't want to, so evil? bad books you don't want to fuck around with. That's, you know, that's, that's basically what we're Very saying. Very evil. Bad books you don't want to fuck around with. Uh, let's talk about. One of my favorite movies, one of your favorite movies. So, uh, 1987's Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. Legend has it that it was written by the Dark Ones, Necronomicon Ex Mortis, roughly translated, Book of the Dead. The book served as a passageway to the evil worlds beyond. It was written long ago, when the seas ran red with blood. It was this blood that was used to ink the book. In the year 1300 AD, the book disappeared. So Evil Dead 2, uh, did you know it had the subtitle Dead by Dawn? I didn't even know that. Yeah. It's on the cover. Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. I've always just thought of it as Evil Dead 2. Um, rated NC-17, which is, uh, you know, way more. We let our our eight-year-old watch it <laughs> with us yesterday. Whoops. Uh, I'm pretty like, sure we're bad parents and we're just super desensitized because it doesn't seem that scary. It just seems like it's just such a funny freaking movie. Right. I exactly. Love, I love evil dead too. There was just a lot of gratuitous, you know, horribly done blood. So, I mean, I think it was NC 17 in the eighties and now it would probably it's, and it, be like it, had, it had a lot to do with the amount of blood. Like literally the amount of blood was a big part of it. And I think they even tried to change the blood color because apparently that made, that was a, that would affect that affected things. Like if you made it like yellow <laughs> or so made dumb. it green, um, which just seems crazy. But yeah. So, but even with all that, they, they still couldn't get a, a lower rating in our rating. Um, but you guys have probably seen this movie. This is one of the, the I think the one of greats. the great horror classics, and and I think I picked Evil Dead Two instead of Evil Dead because I just feel like it's just the more fun movie. Like I love the first one; it's it's a blast too. But Evil Dead Two just takes all of the elements of of the first one and just makes them like so bit much better, better yeah, and so much more fun, um, so much more blown out of oh, before. Man. And that's when he loses his hand, and like it's, it's such a good one. Does he lose his hand in the first one too? I think so. Thought Wait, he did. I don't know. I don't know. No, no, it's funny. I know I need to go back and watch the first one. I just watched the first one too, and I can't remember. Um, but yeah, uh, directed by Sam Raimi. Um, fuck, this guy is prolific as shit. Like uh, Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, uh, Dark Man, uh, Quick and the Dead, Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 3, um, <laughs> Chris's favorite baseball movie of all time, For the Love of the Game. For the Love of the Game. Sam Raimi directed uh, Drag Me to Hell, which I just uh, bought the other day um, and hadn't seen it in a while and watched it again. And it's freaking great, man. Holds up so well. It's such a good movie. Uh, produced a crap ton of stuff. Uh, produced and wrote uh, a lot of Ash vs. Evil Dead. 
as well, um, which we really enjoyed. I thought it was a blast, man. It I was, was so glad to see freaking Bruce Campbell back doing his thing. That first season was so good. So good. I know why you had to cut it off, but that first season is still I don't know. They should have kept it going, man. They should have kept it going. Um, it was it was not a it was not a remake. Evil Dead Two wasn't a remake of the first one. It was they call it a parody sequel, which I think is you know it, it had a lot of the same elements of the first one, mm. but it just uh, what are you looking at? You're you're not sorry. looking at me. It's making me really self conscious. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's like looking down at something. Are you looking at your phone? No, my phone's over there. <laughs> like what are you looking at? I'm just picking. Are you filing your nails? No. I'm sorry. Continue. <laughs> I need your undivided Class attention. Class is paying attention. Gosh. <laughs> I need. I, I need. I need that energy. I know. I'm sorry. I need that audience energy. I was thinking. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, Campbell as as Ash Williams. Um, and now, that now I'm all thrown off. Sorry, I totally lectured you for and way that too long. Jawline. <laughs> The square chin. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, so let, let's read the synopsis real quick and then we'll get into this because I, I wanted to talk about something specifically about Evil Dead 2 that I, I just had not really paid attention to. Um, but let's read the synopsis real quick. Uh, a young man named Ash takes his girlfriend, Linda, to a secluded cabin in the woods where he plays back a professor's tape, a professor's tape recorded rec- recitation of passages from the Book of the Dead. The spell calls up an evil force from the woods, which turns Linda into a monstrous deadite and threatens to do the same to Ash. When the professor's daughter and her entourage show up at the cabin, the night turns into a nonstop, grotesquely comic battle with chainsaw and shotgun on one side, demon horde and flying eyeball on the other. Ooh. It's a good description. Somebody did a good job writing that one. Um, but a couple of reactions after I watched this movie again. Uh, I just watched it a few weeks ago and you know, I, I watch a lot of movies passively where I'm like working on something else and just kind of on in the background. Um, and I was a much more active watcher when we watched it. We watched it yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, dude is a physical comedy. So genius. Good. Like I did not just, I did not realize how little dialogue there was in the movie. So much of that movie is just Bruce Campbell's facial expressions, Bruce's eyes, Bruce's, Hand. physical comment, you know, physical, just physical movements and physical acting and physical comedy and really impressive. Like I didn't, had never really, I mean, I knew it, but I just didn't like, had never really watched it. It's you know? impressive. I love it. Yeah, That's it part cool. of the reason why I loved the first one too, but this one definitely played up on it. So we've got an evil book. We've got the Necronomicon, which, uh, takes kind of takes shape, uh, Less as it's it doesn't take center stage in um, Evil Dead or Evil Dead Two quite as much as it does later on in the Ash versus Evil Dead um, uh, series. In right. Ash versus Evil Dead, the book is fucking active. Mm-hmm. Like it is, it's attacking you. It's becoming part. Didn't it become part of uh, what's his name? Uh, the 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 guy. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. It, it became like part of inside of him. Well, because the Necronomicon X Mortis is said to be a tool written by the banished dark ones. So demons, um, to release them. So this is the one that's bound in flesh. And this is kind of drawn from, um, actually Lovecraft's, um, piece, the hound, where he talks about the actual Necronomicon, which is not bound in flesh. So the two are often kind of, uh, interchanged when they shouldn't be. So the Necronomicon ex mortis is actually is the one flesh. in the flesh. Yeah. And the Necronomicon is just, it's just the book of the dead. Right. Exactly. And so we see, you know, a lot of tropes about evil books um, in, in movies everywhere, but we also see a whole lot in real life, you know, hoodoo, folk magic, modern necromancy, Wicca all play on the idea of these kind of spiritual guidebooks um, with incantations or rituals that can spell books, yeah. ritual books, ritualistic books. Some of the more interesting ones that I found now would be like the, 
the Hecate scriptures um, from 1206 AD, which were kind of like the laws and rules of hell, how to conjure um, and how to command over demons. Um, the grand grimoire. Which is a skill that everybody needs oh, to know. right? It's a handy. Yeah. They got a class at the college now. Mm. I think they just released an app for it too. Oh, you have an you, know? oh, you can get an app to do it? Yeah. Man, that's a great idea. Hakate scriptures. Yes. Yeah. I need a demon control app. There you go. Demon, uh, wireless controlling of demons. Yes. Absolutely. Um, or you could use the grand grimoire or otherwise known as the red dragon, mm -hmm. uh, which dates back to the 1500s and, um, actually was written by King Solomon talking a lot about black magic. Supposedly written. Supposedly. By They've, Allegedly. There's a lot of things that they say were written by lots of people. <laughs> well, after that came the grim Grimoire of Honarius, which is um, basically a book of magic and sorcery and kind of higher order necromancy from the 13th century. Um, in 700 AD Egypt, we saw a book of spells called the Handbook of Ritual Power. And then... This one I found really interesting. It was it was kind of it reminded me of the Beetlejuice um, book. Uh, this one is the Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh -huh. which is a Tibetan Book of the Dead yeah. guidebook for Buddhists on how to kind of transition into the afterlife mm -hmm. and signs and rituals and you know I, I found that so interesting. Yeah, that one comes up in a movie in some movies too. I'm trying to remember which one. I almost want to say Indiana Jones or something brings it up, but I could be wrong. And the uh, the last one that I looked up was the Codex Gigas, the Latin manuscript that contained is said to contain all of human knowledge, um, and written by someone who sold their soul to Satan. Interesting. When Satan? Was that Satan. I don't. Satan. Satan. I didn't write it down. Um, but you know, I really think that we're forgetting the most evil book of all in all of evil book movies. Gray's Sports Almanac. That's right. Man, way to go. I like it. That's right. Gray Sports hey, Almanac. It changed human it history. It changed it made human Biff, history. It made Biff um President. Uh he wasn't president, was <laughs> or he? Like, he was the he was the he was like the he was like a mo casino he was, he was Donald mulger. Trump. He was Donald Trump. He was Trump. Donald Trump, which is what was so crazy. Um but that's <laughs> yeah. the most evil book. You're right. You're right. Grace. That's the evil book in all movies. And it wasn't even written to be evil. That's which right. It that's... was just used for an evil purpose. Exactly. It's how you use the words, right? Exactly. And so I have some more book-based you know, knowledge uh, coming at us later during the um, main attraction. During, during In the Mouth of Badness? Yes. Which will be our feature presentation. I really enjoyed this visit back with Ashy Slashy, though. I did too, and you know it was fun, and I loved seeing the. I love the end of how e the end of Evil Dead to sets up Army of Evil Darkness so well. Dead. Oh yes, sucks him sucks him in the Oldsmobile into you know thirteen hundred AD, and we get the whole backstory you know in the next movie on the on you know on the Necronomicon. And, I love it. I'm a huge Evil Dead. Fan. It's great, man. It's so good. Um, so quick fun fact. Stephen King was a huge fan of the first Evil Dead, and he was the one who encouraged the financing. Uh, Dino De Laurentiis was the main financier of Evil Dead 2, and that was because Stephen King told him to do it. Said, hey, you, you, you know, throw some money behind this. This is some good shit. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Stephen King. Also, Ted Raimi, who I love. Ted Raimi is great. He has he, – he, he, you recognize him in a second if you saw him. Um, but he's Sam Raimi's brother. Um, also, well, most people are, uh, are going to know him as the bathroom condom salesman in blood rage. Um, <laughs> you remember blood rage? <laughs> yep. Yeah. He opens up his coat and he's got a bunch of condoms yeah, in the in very there. beginning yep. towards the beginning. Yeah. That was like his first, that was one of his very first, uh, first films. Um, but he played Henrietta, the big, like Henrietta ghoul you right. know, or, uh, whatever deadite. Um, and he talks about what, freaking nightmare it was the latex suit and just sweating oh, and just, so just hot. a horrendous experience and was so he was like so adamant about how horrible it was and he would never ever ever do it again well they got him back to do it again for <laughs> ash versus evil dead which i thought was so i bet funny. you the technology has advanced hopefully so i mean i don't know i think i heard that it's not that much different like, i would hope so otherwise like good on him thanks uh, for coming back so Evil Dead, Necronomicon, 
There's so many good Ex books. Mortis. With the Necronomicon Ex Mortis, sorry. Um, great evil, evil book movie. And there are many, many others out there. So evil books. dive into those evil books and uh and and stoke your inner bibliophobia. Bibliophilia. Or bibliophilia. Uh, but my favorite, and I think this one just this one was just an obvious, gonna be an obvious Out future presentation uh, for this one, I think. And it was the one I, I've been talking, I've been thinking about doing this one since we started this podcast. I'm like, if we do, when we do Bibliophobia, this is gonna be my feature presentation. Also, one of my favorite movies, probably, gosh, John Carpenter is a hard one to say, like, this is my favorite, but it's definitely one of my top few. Um, I love this movie so much. Uh, just crazy Lovecraftian balls nutty balls to the wallness balls. um 1995's john carpenter's in the mouth of madness our feature presentation and now our feature presentation because the stores could not meet the demand of Sutter Kane's novel In the Mouth of Madness. Kane disappeared two months ago without a trace. He's the guy that writes horror books. You can forget about Stephen King. Kane outsells them all. I need to know if he's alive or dead, and I need that book. It's a setup. It's a setup. I just have to work out how it's set up. Kane's writing has been known to have an effect on his readers. <laughs> See this? It's a map. This whole thing has been staged. You just get out. This is not reality. It's all happening for real, Trent. I will mess you up if you slap me in the back. I know, right? I do not like that. It's like such an intense reaction. Oh my gosh. I have like very few things that just give me that tickling like, that emit like certain tickling. And, and when somebody slaps me in the back, I will hit anything that does it. So like a woman, child, you know, small infant, I don't, it doesn't matter. I'm going to smack him. It's automatic, automatic rage. It really is. I just out. turn around like my, my fist clench. I get so, I get so mad. It's interesting. Is that, we brought that up on this show before. I think, I think so. We? Yeah. It's not good. Uh, well, in the mouth of madness, uh, will uh, I might incite your visceral rage reactions. I don't yeah. know. I don't if you know. have a fear of books, this one will drive you insane. Yeah, if you have a fear of books, this one, this one will, this one will give you a lot of fodder for uh, you know, kind of support. Like, see, yeah, see, it's right. See, look at this. Fuck these. Books. Look at this shit. This this is crazy. Books, yeah, I'm, these books mess you up. They're gonna mess up the world. And then you'll cause end an apocalypse up in an insane asylum. Yeah, they're gonna put you in. Put you in the crazy house. Mom, mom. Is that what they're called? No. Is that the appropriate name from Not a mental all. health perspective? No. No? Nut house? N no. Not good? Also wrong. Wrong? Damn it. Belong like the 1920s. <laughs> <laughs> well, this movie uh, is, you know, uh, it's, I think among horror fans, people really know it and know it pretty well. Um, but among the casual horror fan, this movie is really, really under uh, appreciated. And I think people just haven't seen it. And I don't think for whatever reason, maybe it's just slipped through the cracks, but it's a masterpiece. Like I really, really love this movie uh, directed and scored by John Carpenter. Um, badass score, by the way, I saw somebody bitching about the music in this movie and I love the music in this movie. I think it's fucking amazing. Um, John Carpenter just is to me, like he is, he is the top 
of the list of horror directors. Mm-hmm. Like there just is nobody that has even come close to touching him. Um, if you think about the, from, from Halloween, right. You've got the slasher movie. You've got the thing, which is this amazing sci-fi, sci-fi flick, sci-fi, um, sci-fi, um, sci-fi flick, um, you know, to Prince of darkness, which is like demons. Um, and, and then this, you know, movie that's, that's, uh, you know, this really creative Lovecraftian epic, you know? Um, and actually that's the, that's the trilogy. So the, this, the, those three movies make up what is called Carpenter's apocalypse trilogy. Um, the thing Prince of darkness and, and in the mouth of madness, uh, which they don't have any connection other than that. They are loosely connected by their apocalypse. Their apocalypse. You know, Roman Polanski has what's called the, the apartment trilogy. Um, he would three movies, you know, Rosemary's baby's one of them. And I don't even know what the other two are. Um, but they were just set in apartments. Um, but this is, this is Carpenter's apocalypse trilogy. Um, and you know, it's, it's just there. He is just one of those filmmakers that just everything he touches seems to be amazing. And, and you know, I, I'm sure he's had a few hit or misses here and there, but, um, I really appreciate it. Love it. Um, uh, the movie was written by Michael DeLuca, who's done a whole bunch of shit. Um, including producing all of the 50 shades franchises um, for all you hard up milfs out there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you love it. No, I don't think you've even seen it. Have you? No, I've only fast forwarded to the good parts. What good parts? There's I think like, there's a couple, uh, you know, why would you waste your time when there's actual porn? Because you get bored and you just are curious. You, you know, watch too and much then you fast forward and if you get bored, <laughs> that's a problem. Uh, starring Sam Neill, uh, who uh, plays John Trent, who is an investigator. Uh, he's reprising his role in Jurassic Park, I heard, mm-hmm. um, with Jeff Goldblum. They all and, are, yeah. Yeah, so somebody threw some money at him. <laughs> <laughs> Here, do this. We're going to, we got to, we got to, we got to kickstart Need this to franchise. Energize guys. this franchise. Yeah. Um, David Warner, uh, plays Dr. Wren, um, who's also been in a ton of stuff, a lot of horror stuff too. Um, Julie Carmen plays Linda Stiles, uh, Charlton Heston, going to pry that um, gun out of my cold dead hands. Charlton Heston, uh, plays Jackson Harglow and what Francis Bay plays Mrs. Pickman, who, uh, she's also Adam Sandler's grandma in happy Gilmore. Um, and she, she was great in that movie. So good. Um, and she was great in this movie. She, she's, she's so good. She played good. such a creepy freaking character. Um, she started acting in the 1930s too. Like her first roles were in the 1930s Jeez. and she didn't, I don't think she passed away until, um, like 2011. I want to say like she was like 91 or 92 years old when she died. Um, and Hayden Christensen was in this movie, uh, from star Wars, the Anakin, from the uh, Star Wars prequels. Uh, I played a, a paper boy. So that was kind of a cool little little nugget of information um, when he was like a kid. I guess it was his first film. Uh, but my favorite person in this movie, my favorite actor, Wilhelm von Homburg, uh, who played Simon, one of the town folk guys, uh, but was also Vigo the Carpathian in, in Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters 2. Uh and he was also one of Hans Gruber's goons in Die Hard. As oh, well, nice. Which is also a fun fact. Uh, but researching him, I was like, I just went down a rabbit hole with him. I was like, I got to find out about who this guy is. Because I just love his face. He's just got that, <laughs> that, just that face that's just so freaking creepy looking. Angry. And scary. And it's just, he's got like, I want to say he's got like six foreheads. Like it just rolls down into like different like levels of face. Like he's got like... <laughs> He's got like the like Dante's Inferno forehead. I was thinking like the the Dagwood of faces, you know. It's, just, it's like it's like just stack upon stack upon stack oh my of gosh. layers of face. Um, but he's he uh, he moved to California with his father when he immigrated there uh, from from Germany um, in like 1960 to pursue a professional wrestling career. Him and his dad had nice. a fa- his dad and him had a father son wrestling team. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, as a tag team, 
They were the Vikings. They wore horned helmets. The Vikings? Shiny gladiator outfits. Uh, And then later they were, uh, he was in a a group called the Van Homburg Brothers. Are you still Um, allowed to do that in wrestling or is that cultural appropriation now? The Vikings? Could you be a Viking? The Vikings? I don't know. Well, they're still the the team, the Vikings. That's true. Um, So I thought that was really interesting. He was a wrestler and turned into, you know, um, with his Dagwood face. Well, what do you know? With his his multi layered sub sandwich of a face. You too can be a movie star. Well, let's um, let's do a little quick synopsis of this here movie. Um, and I actually got this one from the back of the VHS box, uh, which was inspired by the Eek Channel podcast because they always go to the back of the VHS box. And when I couldn't find a good synopsis, I was like, maybe I could find a picture of the back of the VHS, and I did. Perfect. So <laughs> thanks, Eek Channel. <laughs> this is what it read. Uh, Master of Horror John Carpenter is back with his scariest movie to date. Sutter Kane is the best-selling author whose newest novel is literally driving readers insane. When he inexplicably vanishes, his publisher sends special investigator John Trent to track him down. Drawn to a town that only exists in Kane's book, Trent crosses the barrier between fact and fiction and enters a terrifying world from which there is no escape. Inspired by the tale, Tales of H.P. Lovecraft, this shocking story is, in the words of its acclaimed director, horror beyond description. So now, would this be considered an an allegory on books and authors' impacts on society? Is that the correct term? Or is it a metaphor? Boy, you know, it's it's meta. It's very meta. Um, cause it's, you know, story within a story within a story right. kind of idea. Like, um, yeah. And I think, I think it, 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 it definitely is a commentary, a little bit of a commentary on fandom, mm-hmm. right. And the obsessive nature of it. Um, a little bit of a commentary on our pop culture kind of, kind of obsessions. Um, you know, I hadn't really thought about it that way, but yeah, I think, you know, for sure. Oh, it's a commentary. It's definitely a commentary on the power and impact that authors have on society. Absolutely. And, culture. And, and the impact that, that words and stories and, and all those things can, can have. I have a list of no other books it. that fucked up culture. Oh, do you? I do. Well, save, hold on to that. Let's, I will. Um, so this movie starts out, we, we've got uh, our Sam Neill character, who's our main character, John Trent. He's in a, a he's in a nut house, um, which is the popular popular uh, proper nomenclature. Popular, um, the po- proper nomenclature uh, from a mental health perspective. I've been told not a mental health perspective. Um, <laughs> and he's basically you know, uh, then we, we then we get flashback to what kind of what what's what happened before, and he's he's hired by this publisher to go seek out the missing Sutter Kane and Sutter Kane is basically compared to Stephen King. They reference Stephen King, even in the movie and say, did everybody hate the ending? Sutter Kane is (laughs) Sutter Kane is, is, is bigger than Stephen King. You know, that's how they kind of bill him. Um, And his books are going crazy and we got to figure out where he is. He's disappeared. You know, we don't know where he's at. His, his his agent can't find him. Nobody can find him. Um, So John Trent takes the case, Right. And he's going to be assisted by, um, well, actually then we have, then we have him being attacked by the agent, right? So this book's making people do, Sutter Kane's books are making people do some weird shit. And so we started seeing this like kind of backstory where there's the people who read these books are starting to kind of go a little insane, go, go Looney Tunes. Um, and, so he's sitting there talking with, I can't even remember who he was talking uh, can't remember who he was talking to or why, but, um, but the agent of Sutter Kane busts through the window to try to murder him. Um, window of a, of a cafe with an or axe. something with an ax. Yeah. Um, and then they, the, they shoot him, you know, somebody shoots him down. Uh, maybe the guy he was with might've been a cop or something. Uh, anyways, so he, he ends up taking this, this gig to track down Sutter Kane, the missing author. Um, and he has tagging along with him, uh, uh, the styles character, um, Linda styles, who was an associate at the publishing place who knew all about Sutter Kane and, and all of his books and stuff. So we start on a road trip. They're going out. They're going to find this dude, 
weird little gremlin dudes on bicycles start cruising around. There's all kinds of weird shit happening. Uh, John Trent falls asleep. The assistant gal it starts experiencing all this weird stuff on the drive. And eventually they end up in daylight and it's, and they're in this weird little town. Right. And John Trent wakes up and he goes, Oh oh, shit, we're already here. All right. You know, like kind of oblivious to all the craziness that happened overnight um, to, to our Linda styles character. Um, And so he ends up, they end up going into this hotel and immediately Styles goes, wait a second. This is all very familiar, right? Um, this garden, uh, this hotel, all of this, this is out of his books. Like this is, I recognize this stuff, right? you know? Um, and, you know, John Trent's just like, well, fuck you, man. This is all, you know, this is, uh, it's just coincidence, you know, whatever. Um, but they find this place and they realize that they're in Hobbs end, which is the fictional place, uh, in the book. And they, they find out, they realize that the, the church in the middle of the town is the black church. That's, uh, like the evil church that's in the, that's mentioned in his books and the hotel they're staying at is the, the evil hotel. Um, and the lady behind the desk is Mrs. Pickman from Sutter Kane's novels. And, um, what's interesting about that, it, you know, going into the, the Lovecraft stuff, right? So, so this whole book, just, just as a little back, little foundation, right? All Lovecraft influence. So beginning to end in this movie is like one Lovecraft reference after another while weaving a Lovecraftian story, which I think he does a fantastic job of. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're not super familiar with Lovecraft, but you were digging into uh, some of it as well when you were doing your research, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, and I found the same thing, you know, like the the actual title of the movie uh, and of the book in the movie is from a title. Right, at the, at the, mountains, at the mountains of Madness is a famous Lovecraft uh, story, novella. Um, so, yeah, in the mouth of madness, at the mountains of at the mountains of madness. Uh, and insanity plays a huge role in in this film, as it does in Lovecraft's a lot of Lovecraft's fiction. Um, so kind of weaving that insanity and all that kind of stuff, real, well, you know, the asylum, the, the flashback common technique that Lovecraft uses. Uh, well, speaking of sane and insane, you know, this movie in particular really showcases how those two concepts can easily switch places and the insane can become a majority. And then that becomes sane. Right. Right. Um, and that thin line between fact and fiction. Right. Right. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to, to quiz you on was, did you hear the music that was playing in the asylum? It was the Carpenters. Yes. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Um, we've only just begun yep. to live. Good job. And promises. Right. Yep. No, nope, that's great. Um, so, so, you know, and, and then, we've got these cool little references throughout too. So the, like the Pickman, Mrs. Pickman, that who's, who's running the hotel, um, you know, she's like, this is one of Sutter Kane's characters, blah, blah, blah. Well, Pickman was a reference to a Lovecraft character as well. And there's a Lovecraft uh, short story called Pickman's model, um, where basically the main character is an artist, but his art is too horrific to be displayed. So they, so, and, and as he is, goes along in this in this story his his artwork actually becomes more and more horrific um and we see in that hotel that there's they keep looking over at this 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 painting and the painting keeps showing gruesome images and keeps changing throughout the time that they're there and keeps showing these things um so i love those little things i mean there's so many cool little references and really neat little nods um, that and, and and all of uh sutter kane's novels have similar titles to lovecraft's novels right so you've got uh the whisper in the, well, the whisper of the dark which is similar to lovecraft's the whisper in darkness uh the thing in the basement which is similar to lovecraft's the thing on the doorstep um haunter out of time which is similar to the haunter of the dark or or shadow out of time which are two different stories um and the hobbs end horror um is similar to the dunwich horror 
so there's so many little things within that are just throwbacks to these love So intentional. Yeah, it's so intentional. And so it's so it's really well done too. It could be, it could be gratuitous, I think. Um, but the way that they weave it into a Lovecraftian story as a whole, you know, it's not just a reference after a reference after a reference. No, it's, it's, it's a using, smart it's nod. using it. Yeah. It's using it so much part. And then of course the, 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 the Cthulhu uh, stuff, you know, with the monsters towards the end. So, so we get, we get, as we go along, I, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but as we go along through, through the movie, um, you know, Sam, the, the Sam Neill character, uh, Trent realizes finally that he's in the midst of this book and they, they locate Sutter Kane inside of the, the, the evil church, you know, or whatever the black church. And they find out that he's, he's, uh, I, I, I took, I, I can't say black church. Cause I'm like, well, it's not a black church. Black churches are great. They have no, great music and people are like praising the Lord. No, it's like, <laughs> It's, it's like it's like a, a dark church, very it's a, dark it's church. evil church, yeah. evil church. Um, so, so he's so he they find him there, and he's writing this this in the mouth of madness uh, novel, right? His final novel, um, and he's all fucking weird and you know cryptic, and you realize that he's made like a pact with the devil or with the old ones and the old ones are like these monsters, these like monstrous demonic creatures um, that basically his writing is going to allow them to take over the world to escape. Right. And take yeah. over the world to escape their dimension and come and come into the world. Um, yeah. That new, the new book is kind of a conduit for them to take over when humanity goes insane. And then once humanity goes insane, they can feed them whatever kind of information that they want. Yeah. And it's after, very so, easy. so after this, then this will happen after everybody reads the book. Yep. So once they read the novel or see the movie, cause they made a movie too. And it's, and the Which reference is, really is, a, is a very meta reference to the actual movie itself. It even shows on one of the billboards, like John the Carpenter's movie poster, New yeah. Line Cinema presents John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness. But in place of the actors' names are the names of the, the characters, characters names. in the in this movie. So it's like meta upon meta upon meta, which I, I just really think is fun. Um, I like that idea, though. Um, and the Vigo character actually says it perfectly when he says, reality is not what it used to be. And that's, it's so interesting to reflect on that and how um, different news and media impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis and actually changes our realities as we know it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think every time you you immerse yourself in something, right, in another world, and a lot of that is, again, kind of that Lovecraftian idea. Um, uh, I always hate to use the term Lovecraftian because it's so overused all the time, but gosh, in this in this movie it's just it's actually uh accurate like, it's it's actually very accurate uh but that the concept of of using you know something literally immersing yourself in something that's that and then it changing everything around you and this this whole concept of the 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 story uh that's being written is actually the you know, you think you're in, are you in reality? Are you in fiction? And then by the time that we, we get to the end, we realize, um, he goes back to the publisher and he says, you know, you can't let this thing be out. Like this is, this is going to, you know, cause the end of the world. Blah, blah, blah. And the publisher's like, you're a fucking crazy dude. You're a nut. You're a nut job. We already published this a long time ago. Yeah. We already published. It's already been published. You came here seven months ago. Like there's all this loss of time. There's all this stuff that's happened and he's realized, and he's, you know, we're like, it's, was it all in his head? Is he just crazy? Is he just some crazy loony, you know, loony dude? And, and then they throw him in the insane asylum because he literally acts as somebody in the head like the, the agent dude did in the beginning or wanted to do in the beginning. Uh, we see Trent actually acts in some, somebody outside of a bookstore who's going in to buy the book. Mm -hmm. um, and so they throw him in, in, into an insane asylum uh, sorry, mental health facility. Um, but, but it was a mental health facility. That's very, it was a very you old, know, school. old school, uh, rubber room type deal. And, you know, we see that 
John Warner character again, interviewing him like we did in the beginning. So the beginning ties to the end. Um, he's still there talking to him about what happened to him and he leaves and he goes, you know, Hey, you know, guys, just one of these other, one of these guys who had lost their mind over this book. Um, but that night the monsters were released. They and, took over and took over everything and killed everybody off. And, and, uh, we end with this great, like scene of, of, him stumbling around in like this post-apocalyptic empty world and then stumbling into a movie theater to, yep. to watch the movie. To watch the movie. And then... Which was starring him, of course. He kind of goes mad while he watches right, it. He just starts cackling and just, you know, it's such a good movie. Such a good movie. And I, I just... All I could think about when we were doing this, when we talked about doing this phobia was like in the mouth of madness. I hope I can introduce this movie to some people who have never watched it before. Because it really does. Every time I watch it, I love it more. And I probably watched it three times this week. Um, and I just love it more every time I watch it. I really do. It's so much fun. I, I, you really enjoyed it too. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of power in it. And, and a lot of power of um, the author behind the written word and how it impacts other people and how there is a responsibility, you know, when you do write those things. Because there have been books that in history have – have literally changed history in horrible ways. I mean, give us, give us, give us that list. We were, you brought the, it up the books that uh, screwed up society list. Okay. So the first one, I mean, of course well, we got mind comp. We've heard of mind comp. Um, you know, it touted racial superiority and inferiority and uh, German dominance. Um, but you know, he, ra- he based a lot of that stuff off of a, a book about, um, about uh, that was written in America about what's that what's shoot what's the word for i can't think of the the um that that races we need to weed out uh certain genes within our races um eugenics eugenics thank you um yeah so i so that's the next one which was by uh sanger pivot of civilization which really touted and preached the eugenics Eugenics movement movement. like a mofo right which uh came out three years before hitler's mein kampf well there was another book that was even written before sanger's that was that was influential on her as well and they said that Hitler actually had a copy of it and was very much inspired by it. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but yeah. I'm sure I have it on here. Um, another one would be The Prince by Machiavelli, mm. which was the inspiration for a long line of tyranny, such as Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, Napoleon of France. Um, France. French. <laughs> French. <laughs> 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 Napoleon of the French. French. Um, uh, but Machiavelli hoped to inspire a revolution through that writing. Um, another one would be the Malleus Maleficorum, mm-hmm. which launched centuries of witch hunts um, in Europe and came out just before the Protestant Reformation. Yep. Um, coming of age in Samoa, which was a really interesting one, um, about an anthropologist studying sensuality in the 1920s in Samoa. Um, and these Samoan girls told her these wild lies, um, and jokes of promiscuity in their, you know, in their growing up, um, experiences that were all lies and they were being kind of ironic and, and sarcastic, but she published this and a lot of people believed it. And so there was this big kind of upheaval around um, an increase in awareness of ethnography and anthropological studies and making sure that they're, you know, relevant and pure fact. Um, Das Kapital was another one. Communist Manifesto, those Karl Marx. Marxist, Communist uh, Manifesto, Mar- Marxist um, Democracy and Education by Dewey, which convinced many that education is not about facts and it disparages schooling. Uh, he was also one that found ma- founded pragmatism. Prag- pragmatism. pragmatism. Mm-hmm. Pragma- blah, 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 blah. Was that the same Dewey from the Dewey Decimal System too? I think so. Yeah. Um, the pocketbook of baby and child care is actually responsible for about 50,000 deaths. Um, in children oh, wow. because it actually gave terrible advice um, about putting babies to sleep on their stomachs. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Because uh, he said that they would choke on their own vomit if they were laying on their backs. 
So um, after that was published, about 50,000 children um, died from that. It's crazy. Yeah. There have been, uh, it, it, the written word is so powerful. I mean, you know, what's interesting. We didn't even really talk. Uh, we talked a little bit about the the Bible with the Gutenberg uh, press and things like that. But, you know, one of the most influential books of all time and the still, still the, the most um, purchased book in the world, um, you know, lifetime wise, it really incredible that the written word has that much power mm -hmm. um, and has that much power to, to do good and to do evil, you know, and, and sometimes certain books can, can, can do, can both, do both or, or, or depending on how they're interpreted or how they're, they're, they're played out or how people respond to them. So really interesting uh, topic. And I think there's something so uh, in, this could really have been a multi-part one oh, too. Easily. I mean, there's tons of movies as well, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll circle back on this at some point um, in some other phobia or some other uh, uh, episode as well. But um, really interesting stuff. Yeah, it was great. It was a lot um, more fun than I thought it was going to be. Thought it was gonna I, be I actually boring. thought it was going to be a good, I mean, I really liked, I was kind of looking forward to this one. I was, I was excited about it. So, uh, I think we're going to do, I haven't really talked to you about it yet, but I want to do Sam Hanophobia. What is that? The fear of Halloween. Oh, how timely. Yeah. Yeah. We got some movies to, you know, we're coming up on Halloween and, uh, we're going to be gone in LA. It. So we're not gonna be able to record this weekend. So we'll see if we get one out next week. It'll probably be another two week. Till we get another one out, um, which will be perfect because it'll be right before Halloween, right? Maybe like the week before. Um, so let's plan on that. Um, we're gonna do a little little Halloweenophobia, uh, and that'll be a lot of fun. So thanks for listening, Feardos. We appreciate it. We appreciate all of your support and your likes. Um, please go to your podcast apps and give us a review and a rating and all that fun stuff. And until next time, stay afraid. Stay very afraid.